All right, everybody, welcome back to Confessions of a Reformer. I'm your host, Mike Myers-Chiro, and I've got a special guest with me today. You might have seen Colton Underwood in the NFL. You might have seen him on The Bachelor. You might have seen him on Netflix. You might have seen him on all of the things, but I have with me here today, Colton Underwood. Colton, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Of course, I'm honored. So brief background on how I got connected to Colton. Obviously, you guys know my coming out journey. I didn't... I wasn't a big fan of The Bachelor. I've literally to this day not seen an episode, so I probably shouldn't be saying that right now, but like I've never really been a Bachelor person, but I have a bunch of friends who are obsessed with The Bachelor, right? And so I'd heard Colton's name a few times, but again, just like didn't really care much about The Bachelor world, so it didn't register until I found out that this Bachelor came out as gay, and there was all this controversy around it. I was like, what? And then a month before I came out publicly, Colton, your Netflix series came out, Coming Out Colton, right? And so I watched that by myself, just binged it. And it was so validating and comforting and encouraging and terrifying at the same time, right? Because that's just such an intense season, right? And I remember there were multiple moments in your process that I was like, yes, thank you. Oh my God, you were just saying things that so deeply resonated with things I didn't know how to say yet. Didn't have language for That was like one of the most difficult things was finding English to communicate what the feelings were and the experience was like, right? And you just like let them film this whole process and you like literally coming out to people on camera, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was such a gift. It was so wild. So anyway, I was like so struck by that. Yeah. And then I'd seen, I started following you obviously on Instagram and then I'd seen you kind of confront or expose some of the hate you were getting from the Christian community. I was shocked. I was shocked at what they were saying to you. I was surprised at like how gracious and compassionate you were being. And it was actually kind of inspiring to me. And I think I've never said this out loud publicly anywhere, but I think watching your process has actually like influenced the way that I decided to show up publicly in certain ways, right? Like you inspired me to like have a certain posture and like intentionality with the crazy that came at me. So anyway, that's just some intro. I don't know why it's coming out right now, but I'm just blasting (laughs) you. Um, Colton, thanks for being here. Um, so for people who kind of loosely know who you are, would you mind just giving us an intro of what your life is like right now? Like, what do you do now? Who are you oh, now? What a great question. Um, I'm still figuring that out. No, <laughs> I, I really took a step back the last year and a half and I valued my privacy over anything. I think it just became a little overwhelming filming because I filmed three of the Bachelor franchise shows in one year and they obviously all played out over, I think, a span of you know, two years, two and a half years. And then I went, you know, into COVID and my coming out journey. And, you know, I I happened to be connected with these producers who wanted to film it for Netflix because they sort of had the inside scoop of like what I was going through. Um, So it just was a lot all at once. And and I say that because then it it sort of allowed me to take a step back for, for like about a year, year and a half to focus on my relationship, to really prioritize and figure out like what, felt good to me what did I want to do how did I want to contribute to society other than just sharing my life because I didn't feel like there was longevity in that just for me but also just I think just my mental health I it just it it was so draining to always be open and vulnerable and I didn't <laughs> want that so um, I'm moving more into producing creating content directing um, everything sort of my north star is you know does this bridge America does this help our country? So that's sort of the question that I ask before I sign on to a project or before I take it on is, is, is this the type of content that I want to put out? Would this have been helpful in my journey and for me to watch as a, you know, a young kid or adult? Nice. Okay. Yeah. Great. That's very cool. I can't imagine being as vulnerable and as open as you. I've listened to some of your interviews as well. And like, you're just so like transparent and like engaging and like really impressed because that is so taxing. So I can imagine needing a break from that. Um, Were you married when you shot the- No, no, I was was single when we shot it. um, And then everything happened all at once right after. And it was the most beautiful and best thing ever. But I I also knew like I was going to, that's why I try to keep it as private and as hidden as possible is because like, you know, I witnessed while I was coming out the press and the reaction and having to navigate that entire world. And I just saw how cruel some people could be. So I really just wanted to protect it. Um, and that's what I did. Yeah, totally. Smart. Okay, nice. I know seeing your, your show and then seeing that you were married sometime shortly after that, I was like, whoa, whoa, when did this happen? And I was like, oh, it must have happened behind the scenes. And so yeah, the privacy thing. Nice. Okay. So one of the things that I think is really interesting and that we definitely have overlap in our world is that you grew up 
I'm going to say Christian, Christian, you grew up evangelical? No, I went to Catholic. So Catholic grade school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess I just kind of want to ask an open-ended question. Like, yes. What was it like being gay growing up in that context? It was very, very confusing. I like, I think I, I've said this publicly a bunch, but I think I, you know, at the age of six, I just knew I was different and I didn't really know what that meant until I went through puberty and got into high school and really started figuring myself out. Um, but, you know, when you're that young, you sort of are like looking for your identity, you're building it. And for me to have, you know, religion class at 8 a.m. every morning and be an altar boy and serving at seven before school even. And then on the weekends and my church my family was all going to church on Saturdays and or Sundays and, and beyond just on the holy days. Um, it, it really sort of like stuck with me as part of my identity and, and really something I clinged on to. And then also just carried a lot of shame around just because of, you know, who I knew I was born to be, but also without the permission to actually be that. Yeah, totally. Okay. So when you ended up coming out, I'm going to try to avoid asking you questions I've seen you already answer in other interviews, but yeah, coming out was a whole experience for you and a choice you had to make. And you're already in the public eye, obviously, and that's so intense. Were you still involved in the church at that point? Yeah, I mean, throughout the bachelor days and even in my coming out, that was definitely one of the biggest hurdles for me. I think I remember telling the producers, I said, I'm just scared because I have the possible, I have a possibility if I stay rooted in my faith to alienate the gay culture because, you know, the LGBTQ plus community does not like the religious community and then vice versa. So if I stayed in my religious community, they wouldn't like me because now I'm part of the LGBTQ plus community. So I didn't like, I was really scared to lose both communities or not like even feel a part of either just in its own way. So navigating that was extremely difficult. And um, also just like the micro communities within both communities, I think was intimidating and there's a lot of different things that goes goes into both of those and it just was a really overwhelming that like transparently I sort of just shut down after I filmed the show as I was just like I need a break I can't tackle this right now I have so much more going on in my life that I need to figure out so I sort of hit pause just as far as you know my faith journey went okay so then at this point now like with everything you've been through do you consider yourself spiritual religious catholic christian like how do you not necessarily what does the world need to label you as but like how do you yeah. consider yourself and all that um i still consider myself a christian man and a man of god and, and i believe in I, I have my faith and my faith is on my own terms now it's not confined to a religious building it's not confined to a certain day a certain hour um i, I don't I, i've since taken a pretty big step back as far as scripture goes like it's not something that i live by or think is like necessarily the exact word of God like that's not how I'm wired anymore and, and what I believe in um so in, in in it was such a healthy and fun good thing for me to sort of have to reevaluate what I believe in and what I don't and where I'm at and I think that's the best route for anybody is just it's it's your it's your business it's your um your journey and it could look different than other people's totally agreed with that i have seen a few times like i've visited your comment section a few times and you still have you're you're brave for that <laughs> are you saying that you don't look at your comment section anymore? i try not to i really i really try not to i think it's it's healthy not to and mm -hmm. you know to what you said at the top of the interview is like i really try not to meet hate with hate and there's certain times like I say that and I don't want to sound like a hypocrite because like I definitely you can probably see throughout my history of being in the public eye I've tried it all I've tried being mean to people being mean to me I've tried calling them out I've tried to kill them with kindness I've tried to ignore I've tried to block and move on it's just there is no right answer it's sort of what is going on in that in that moment but yeah I definitely try to stay out of there now um just and and also I just reevaluated what social media is to me in my life it's it's just not it's more so a work tool um i say that but then like i do read heartfelt messages that are like you helps me come out you saved my life and like those that's not work to me <laughs> so it's just like i'm still trying to figure out that balance as well but yeah what did you see listen i mean i get some ugly comments in my section obviously but you have a lot more comments i'm surprised how many like it's what i would assume is right-wing evangelicals still follow you or still yep. engage 
when they're obviously so upset and so judgmental they've i mean i made a, a graphic or like a picture one time of you like you did like a I, photo and i stole it from you because i was did. like this is it. this is summing up how i feel like uh, yeah. i need people to see this yeah exactly i mean i was like i can't believe what's happening like you did this photo shoot or like carousel whatever of you like on a bed in your underwear with a newspaper and then i looked at the comment i don't know why i was like what are people saying about this and the comments were absurd i mean in my opinion absurd and ridiculous and so i just no. Six screenshots, some of these most absurd comments and just put them on the photo with you, buried you of that, you know, you're just in your underwear, buried, there's basically no room of you on there anymore because the comments just took up so much of the, the space. Which I can confirm, I had underwear on behind the newspaper. <laughs> Everybody just thought I was like, <laughs> and I had socks on. I was like, it was somewhat, one of the more innocent photos that I posted for sure. Right, I mean, yeah, agreed. And so the comments that were coming in were just so judgmental. It was like awkward to me how obvious the projection was, but all how dehumanizing it was and just like inappropriate and out of line. And, and it was so many of them. And so I just like wanted to share that just as an ode to, I think, even my respect and appreciation for your journey, but also just like, do we see this? This is crazy. Like, listen to these yeah. people. And so you get a lot of really specific, hateful messaging, especially from people who've been like watching you from other iterations of your life. And I think demand some kind of something from you, even though you've evolved and, or maybe never owed them that in the first place. Right. So I guess I have a couple of questions there. One, like, do you find yourself like having people making demands of you that you're like, that has nothing to do with, you know, yeah. How, how is that for you? And then I have another question. I don't know. I think, you know, a lot of therapy has helped me sort of dissect this. And, and here's what I've come up with is I've been in the public eye some way, somehow since I was 24. Um, and even beyond that, like in college, I was on billboards and like in my small college town for the football, being an all American football player, like that's just sort of how it was. So when people met me on TV, you know, or then maybe they met me somewhere in my NFL journey, like they met a version of me in my 20s. Your 20s is really about discovering who you are and figuring yourself out and taking risks. And I was moving across the country. I was playing for the Chargers in San Diego. I was, I, I very much was like, while going through figuring out the NFL is not going to be forever for me. So like I had three years, I was on three different teams. I was on the practice squad. I wasn't even on the active roster. And I was really just like, what's next? And then obviously I fell into the bachelor franchise and filmed that when I was in my mid twenties. And, you know, there was a, that's a whole layered complex issue of like why I even joined that franchise. But I think someone like you would understand, like I was trying self-conversion therapy. Like the more I felt like I got in the heterosexual norms in society, the more that I would actually become straight. That's what I believed. And it didn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. I just want to go like, I understand some people think like all of this conversion, like it doesn't work. What happens is it just becomes so heavy in shame and you get so far in that you can't get out. What I've realized that was those people held me to this version of myself that I no longer was. And they weren't in those private moments of me having to come up to my therapist, come out to my family outside of the Netflix show where they got to really dive into like what, what all went into those decisions and, and why I am who I am today. So then when now when people see me and I'm in version 35, since you've met me on your TVs and they're like, what is this? You know, it, and I guess partially to blame is like the Netflix algorithm, because I still every once in a while I'll post something with my husband and they'll be like, wait, what happened to the girl from the show? And I'm like, that was what, six years ago at this point, Set, like five years ago. I was like, what, where have you been? You know, they are for sure. You use the word projecting. That's what, you know, that's a lot of it is they want to color out to the lines. They want to have the freedom that I now have. And for whatever reason, wherever they are at in whatever community they're in, they feel like they can't be themselves. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very well put. So my second question to that was like some of the more hateful, like specifically anti-gay, typically because of the Bible, because of Christianity comments you get, I've seen you be like surprisingly gracious and compassionate and like understanding, maybe I would use that word for these haters of yours. Like, where is that coming from? What is going on? Like, what is that? It took me a while after coming out to find my lane in our community. I think a lot of people, you know, I had a lot of criticism. A lot of the queer media outlets were not kind. I mean, I have screenshots still to this day of reporters calling my Netflix show a pile of garbage wrapped in a rainbow flag, like to all these different head headlines of like advocate out them, like all of these queer led publications that I would love to do a lot of work with that like 
I don't know if that, you know, whatever's going on in their, their department, I don't know if they would ever work with me, but like, I experienced it firsthand. I was like, I, I would never lead this way. I consider the media leaders in our community. I just think it's crazy that they would lead that way because here's someone who's like new to the community, freshly out, and you're just sort of dogpiling on them because it would get you clicks and views. And it was really confusing. Now it's helped me build my own career and like find the clarity of where I want to be in our, our community. I'm not someone who's patient, kind, and, and slow to educate. I definitely believe that there's space and room for people to protest. I believe that we need to advocate and stand up for our rights. And at times we have to be loud. I, however, am not that person. I'm not the right voice for that. So like I would encourage people who feel like they would do a good job with that to go do that. My role in our community is to serve as a bridge. My following is still very conservative from my bachelor days. I, for whatever reason, the privilege that I have in being a white cisgender man, they're, they're more likely to listen to me. That's just facts. Yeah. So now I have this opportunity to educate a group of people in our country that don't really understand our community. And that's my approach in this is, you know, you can call me as whatever name you want to call. I'll be slow and patient and kind with you because like, that's just sort of my goal and my my role in our community is to hold someone's hand bring them along if they move up an inch that's progress and like that helps them like i am not a trans man but i can help someone understand a journey of a trans man by introducing them to just me as a gay man first before they get to there you have to crawl before you could walk before you could run and that's very much sort of my approach with um combating hate and people who don't understand me yeah, love that. I I totally agree. So me two years ago, you know, I might have said something different, but having been like publicly engaging with this conversation, I'm I'm finding like there are some things I cannot condone or be part of or whatever because of my experiences and how strongly I feel about this. But there are other people who are queer who like are giving space and are able to hold, you know, and I'm like, great, I love it. That's there. It's not me, it's not my lane. I can't be that person. But I'm not saying that there shouldn't be people like that. I just can't in my own yeah. world. Be Right. And so I, my appreciation for other people at different paces, different approaches from different vantage points and angles and identities. I'm like, yeah, we, I love the diversity there. Please let's all like bring our own flavor. And yeah, so helpful. Cause there are, you're right. There are people who would listen to you with your, yeah, that's huge. I love that. Oh, can you celebrate that like crazy. Okay. So the Christian side of this, the religious, the faith side, do you yeah. still, find yourself actively engaged in a faith community or does that feel like something you're kind of on pause with as you're still on going on the journey? Um, transparently, I'm pretty much, I'm pretty on pause. It took me a long time to really find my lane in the gay community. Now I'm, I am moving more towards that for, for many different reasons. It was enough to sort of just tackle the public at, at one point and then, and then, you know, let alone the faith. I do. I, I was pretty outspoken though. Like if there was a comment like, you know, I try to stay out of my comment section, but if there was a comment that was getting a lot of attention or buzz in the religious world, I would, I would look at it just because I want to have the understanding of where they're coming from. You know, I think that was sort of important just for me to like keep a pulse on of like where people are at, because like it, it helps me along my journey weirdly, not that I valued it so much or just from an understanding level. I think the best way for me to explain like I did was like, I'm a man of God. I'm, I have faith. I am a Christian. I just do not belong to a physical church right now. And I think that's the healthiest thing for me. I've done it all. I've been an altar boy. I've been, I belong to faith groups and churches. I belong to Bible studies. I, I mean, I still pray. There's so many different things that like people would look at me and be somewhat confused in the religious community, but it's like, this is faith too. This is, this is what being a man of faith looks like just as much as you attending your church every Sunday at 11. You know, my faith looks different. My relationship with God is not conditional and I, I'm not scared of him. I think that was like the big thing growing up in the Catholic church is like, I feared God. You were sort of taught that, you know, in, in prayer, you had, I had to learn my prayers and say them. And a lot of the verbiage, a lot of the scripture, you really feared God and what he would do to you and condemn you for your actions and that's not my take on it anymore. Um, if anything, he empowers me and he's given me this platform. He's given me this, this opportunity to be the bridge. He's given me a way to work through him like many other people will claim they have been enabled by him. That's just sort of how I, I approach it.
how did you go from God's scary, you know, there's all these threats and whatever to like where you are now? Was there like a pivotal moment or like, how did you get from there to here? Yeah, it was the first time that I like thought, weirdly, I like thought about praying to him and I didn't end it with, can you please help me not be gay? Like that was like a, all of my prayers for the most part. I just remember them. They're always at the end of it, like asking to help me figure this out because like I didn't want to be gay. So like, I remember weirdly after I came out, I was in ther therapy and I ended up going to a service. I want to say I'd only come out to my mom. And then I went to a mass service with my dad um, and his wife and my, and my bonus mom. And we were praying and I didn't, I remember so vividly, like not, cause it was such a norm, normal thing for me to do and be like at the end, like, God, can you please help me get through this? Like, I really need to figure out like what's going on in my sexuality. And I never, I didn't say it and, or think it. And it was a pretty big moment. And you were kind of surprised by that. Yeah, because I feel like I, at that moment, I just like, I was praying as a, as a gay man. Like, even though I publicly wasn't out to them in my church, like I was, I was, it was like my first time praying as like an out gay man because I told my mom. Oh, wow. Oh, so do you feel like you telling your mom was part of what allowed you to have that experience in that prayer? Yeah, I do. I mean, and look, I have to also give credit to other people. I, you know, my coming out journey was different because I wasn't like traditionally outed behind the scenes I was. So I, I dealt with some blackmail and like my publicist and my management and like my business side of my professional team knew before my family just because like they had to in order to like protect and help my career. Like that's their, their job and what they do. And so like they were helpful in it. They helped me prepare for my conversation with my mom and go from there. <laughs> wow. And then I heard in an interview you did that your mom was like, she had a rainbow sticker on her car before you'd even come out. And you're like, mom, I don't, you know, can you, you don't need, and she's like already there as an ally. I was like, that is so cool. I my mom, it was, it was, you know, looking back, I should have felt more comfortable confiding in her. Cause like, you know, there was a shift in our relationship after she separated from my dad of like becoming more of my friend. And then like, I would visit her in her apartment and then she moved in and she actually had two roommates and one was a gay man. And they, it, it was like, it was this fun, it was like fun. I was like hanging out with her and I should have confided, but yes, as soon as I came out, she had like this rainbow, sh she loves rescuing dogs. She's on her like eighth rescue right now, a German Shepherds. And she, I remember going to the back of her car and I was like, you know how like there's the rainbow bridge is what they call it for dogs when they pass, they go on, they, they say like, so it was like somewhat of that analogy, but it was also like a pride sticker for a dog shelter. And I was like, mom, and she's like, what? People don't know what car I drive. And I was like, yeah, but they're gonna ask questions. She's like, I'll just say it was for my friend. And I was like, okay. It was, uh, but I was like, it was a little too soon because I hadn't come out to the rest of my family. Oh, God. nice. That's awesome. Yeah. And I love hearing that because like I'm in this place with my mom where, she, you know, she's like trying to figure out what to do with who I am and our relationship. And it's been really painful for us. So I like hearing that was like, oh, I love that. That's so yeah. cool. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. So I want to, I'm curious, I know you said like six, you knew you were different. Was there a point where from knowing you were different, you went from that to like, oh, I'm gay. Like, was there a point when, if that happened, like, what was that like for you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's puberty. I mean, a, a lot of people, when they go through puberty and they're teenagers, like, you're, it's weird. It's uncomfortable. It's hard. Like, and, and now I can't even imagine it with the digital era. But I just knew, like, I would get aroused. I, you know, like, my first crush, and it was even more confusing because my first crush was a girl. It was Jennifer Aniston. It was not a guy. <laughs> Um, but like even her, like what I've come to realize for me, I really value energy and Jennifer Aniston, in my opinion, had pretty masculine energy and a lot of the character, I don't know her like personally, but like a lot of the characters she portrayed, she just sort of had this like fuck it boss attitude where I was like, oh, that's like this masculine energy that I'm really into. So she was my first crush, which then confused me even more. But then physically I started getting more aroused and turned on by the features of men than women. And I think like that's just like obviously the simple way to sort of break it down. Yeah, yeah, nice, okay. I don't know if you've shared this anywhere, I haven't heard it yet, and I'm just curious, this is so random and out of left field, but how did you and your now husband meet? Yeah, we met shortly after the Netflix show was about to wrap. Like yes. I said, I was sort of going through a rough time publicly and also even weirdly within our community where they didn't know how to feel about me. They were like, he just monetized the gay experience. He's, I was like, I'm just trying to survive here. and. Trust me, I did not get paid that well to do this show, but like I did it um, and they were fantastic to work with. It just like optic wise just didn't work. The public didn't know how to take it. And 
um, my friend Gus from the show was basically like, let me throw you a party in LA and invite a bunch of gay men who are in my community and show you how beautiful this can be. And a lot of those people who are at that party are still in my friend circle today and my social circle. And Jordan was one of them. And I didn't even get to spend too much time with him at, at the party. But two months after we were on the same trip to Cape Cod in um, P-Town and we just bonded there and just had a lot in common. And it just sort of grew and built. And I was spending more time in LA because I was living in Denver at the time. So we would see each other. And it just was like one of those things like, that moved pretty quickly, uh, but felt right and was so easy. Nice. Had you been envisioning marrying a man for a while? Was that like something new that came with the coming out experience or like, what was that like for you? It was definitely different. Um, I, I shared with him pretty early on, like in our relationship, like I had never had an emotional connection with a man. All of my interactions with men were purely physical. They're purely there for pleasure and for me to get in, get out. And like, I didn't, you know, talk to them. I didn't look them in the eye. I didn't kiss them. I just like really dis was disconnected when I was like hooking up. And I, I shared that pretty early on. And he was very like helpful and understanding and slow and patient. And then, you know, I obviously had a lot of voices in my head and, and not in my head, a lot of voices around me telling me to like stay single, go hook up, go like they really were promoting, not promoting, uh, encouraging me to like just go explore go bang like you just go like have fun and like this is what being gay is all about and I was like but being gay to me was like building a family like I, I kept the same traditional and the tra same values that I that I had as a straight man and, and that was like that's part of the journey that I'm still on is like untangling this mess of my of who I am because like what parts do I want to keep with me I'm like shedding all these layers I'm like finding this freedom and having so much fun being authentic, but like what part of me do I want to keep intact? Getting married, having a family, becoming a dad, like all of these things are priorities and goals of mine. And that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. Listen, I want to ask you about the dad thing, but before I ask you that, I want to ask, you'd mentioned earlier, which I totally relate to, there was like a contrast between the queer community and the Christian community. And you kind of yep. like had trouble participating or belonging to either. And you're towing this line, which I feel similar. Like I have to like navigate constantly, like, you know, so I was wondering for you, what did you find as far as like the challenges? Um, what was meaningful, or important? What were your lines? Like, how have you navigated being a gay man and maintaining your faith when both communities are kind of like culturally at war with each other. Like, can you speak to that? How's that been for you? I mean, it's been challenging. It's been extremely challenging both internally and externally. I think a lot of people misunderstand both communities. And I feel like that's sort of weirdly been my challenge and what I feel like is fun for me to be in it too, is I, I now can say that I proudly represent both. And um, I feel like more people you know, I, I don't know all of your stances, but I, I know that you're thoughtful and, and ask questions and you're interested, like more people like us need to be in this position where we can communicate with both sides and sort of serve as that bridge, that mediator to be like, actually think about it this way. Like, that's what I try to explain to people who are like, how dare they vote this way or not? And I was like, think about it this way. For example, like my town in a farm town in Illinois, like we only had one gay man out gay man in the entire town. Like you only know what you know. If you've never interacted before social media, if you never interacted or saw representation, you wouldn't know how to act either. You'd be scared and you would make mistakes. And that's very much the approach that I take with this. It's like, these people don't know better. You know, whatever church they're going to, whatever religion they're a part of right now, they are finding identity in it and they're confused. They might be hurt themselves and they just need what they need in that moment. And I think that's sort of been my, my approach with it. But yeah but yeah <laughs> nice okay it's not yeah. simple it's oh, it's yeah. really really fucking hard and and you know you've uh, you know i've lost some friends over it and you know i've but i've it's important to like be patient understand like understand like, like look they probably are going through something privately that they don't trust or like want to confide in me at this moment but maybe you know there's a full circle and i don't know i, I don't i haven't publicly shared this but there was like one I'm trying to protect everybody in it. So, cause like they're not publicly out. So like there's this one opportunity that I had where I was 
at a Bible. This is when I was still closeted. I was in Bible study, very conservative church, very anti LGBTQ plus high, like did not understand, did not want to even go there. Like immediately, like, nope, hard line, can't do it. Our friend group at the time was sort of rallying and like my Netflix show comes out and I hadn't spoken to him in a long time. And I'm like, Hey, this person wants to connect with you. And it was like, maybe, and it was almost like a, maybe they want to try to pull you back into the Bible study. And I was sort of was like, eh, I'm not there. And I was like, all right, I'll have the conversation with him. And he came out to me and I was like, I thought this person was trying to suck me back into it. And like little, and he didn't, he shared with me that our other people didn't know. So like, it was a whole, I was like, whoa, you're like the leader of this group, but then you want, you're, you're telling me this. So like, it's, it, it was a little out of left field. It caught me off guard. I certainly was not prepared for it. I was not, I, I'm all, I also at that time was not ready to be a role model, which was a whole nother thing. Like I think people assumed cause I had a Netflix show, like I was ready to be a role model and I wanted it. Like I was coming into our community to be like, this is what we need. I was like, I did not want to be that. I, I really wanted to like just disappear and figure myself out. But then obviously I, I had this platform and this privilege and people confiding in me. And I'm like, I'm, this is too much right now so it, yeah it's it's a uh, it's an ongoing thing okay so on that what what was your personal reason for doing coming out colton if it wasn't like hey you guys here's an example of like how to do this like what was your motivation i i don't know I, the, the producers were two gay men who i was previously working on a project with this blackmail thing happened i had to come out to my publicist they sort of I like we were working on the show. I pulled out. They sort of knew some things that were going on. They reapproached me and were like, "Hey, you know, if you ever want to document this." And like, obviously, like I had I I was good at reality TV. Like I I did it, you know, three shows and it performed very well. And people America liked me, you know. And so we started engaging in conversations and, you know, I was really sort of burned by the previous show that I did. And I didn't really know how to trust people again. And I was like, this is so intimate. What if my family doesn't respond well? And all of a sudden you have them on camera, like not understanding me. And like you paint my mom or my dad, who I want a relationship with in the poor light. Like I believed in my family and knew who they were, but also it was really scary. Cause I was like, I'm giving these people trust. So it was a lot of back and forth of like, can I have final say in the edit? Can I help with the direction of what the show is going to be while remaining present? And I think the final reason I, I said yes to do the show was because there was this moment, I don't know who sat me down, but they were basically like, if you could have watched something like this when you were in high school or in college, would this have helped you come out? And I was like, absolutely. And they're like, why, then why not be that person? nobody else is going to do it like it, it's there's been no athlete masculine cisgender like whatever whatever you want to say like there's representation in drag there's representation all across the board in our community there hasn't really been like a story documented about like middle america and there's a lot of queer men in middle middle america and unfortunately a lot of them are married to women <laughs> so that was sort of my final thing is like, I could try to help people live their most authentic life. Wow. And I'm sure you have, right? You've been so instrumental for so many people in their own, especially gay men, right? Like coming to terms with themselves. Like it's been, yeah. I think that was like what I, I realized now is like, you know, LA gays and New York gays, like they have the representation in theater and, and music and all the arts, right? Because they have that culture and they're in it. And there's, a lot of culture lacking in our in middle america you know unfortunately the biggest the church is the biggest thing in, in a lot of these midwest and, and it's not that it does not preach and promote diversity and um inclusion so i figured why you know why not and i feel like i thank you for saying that though i do i do feel like i help just knowing like some of the messages that i get but um, I'm trying to do more. I'm like, how can I, how can I continue to help and continue to be that bridge? Well, I mean, it's impacted it, you, your journey, your show, your story has massively impacted me. So at least here, thank you. And I know you get a ton of messages, like that, but yeah, you have your bravery and example has been such an impact on my process. So I'm very thankful. Well, thank you for saying that. And I, I'm, I'm excited for you too. I think 
specifically, there's a lot of work to be done in, in our faith community and for you to be a leader in that. And also just like highlighting and showing like even like the little thing you did for like the comments and like, you know, I didn't have time to pick apart every single comment like that and screen grab it. Trust me, I wish I would have. But when I saw that, I was like, oh, people need to see this. Because like, this is like to humanize my experience. Like I am a person. I do, you know, at times read your comments. So like for you to like say, I'm, you know, well, I don't remember which one of the girls who I did respond to. She was like, you've fallen off or like you you really fell from a place of grit. And I was like, I I feel like I haven't fallen. I've, I've been, I've been thriving. What do you mean? <laughs> totally. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So I know we got to land this plane. You mentioned you wanted to be a dad. Yeah. Um, got this sign behind you. Tell me what's going on with the dad. Yeah. Start, yeah. Daddyhood. What, what's going on here? Daddyhood. Um, I, you know, I went back and forth with this project specifically, like, what did I want to do next in my career? Is it, you know, another TV show? Is this, I started a digital series slash podcast called Daddyhood, in which I've been documenting my fertility journey and family building with my husband. And um, it's been so much fun, but it's also been really emotional. There's been moments where I've sort of pulled the plug on it. I was like, I cannot do this. Like, it's too much. Um, I, you know, when I first started, I, I got tested. I got my sperm tested and I had, you know, I kid you not, word for word from the doctor it was like, You're, you had four sperm and three of them were dead and not moving and they gave my husband his results and like 55 million sperm per unit and like you're so it's healthy and I'm like so I had to like basically change a lot of lifestyle things and and get healthy so that I can be fertile I was essentially sterile um and nobody talks about you know the male fertility and anytime you hear fertility struggles or problems it's always blamed on women I'm sort of like exploring that i'm exploring surrogacy i'm exploring adoption i'm exploring our, our black community and the stigmas that are around there not only for mental health but also just for fertility and conceiving i i'm really just getting into all of it and, and it's been so beautiful and cool to see at the heart of it my like if i had a tagline for it it's just humanizing the fertility and family building experience so i really want to just humanize it for people and like there's no right or wrong you know our gay community comes after gay men who go through surrogacy because it's a privilege and expensive and I get it there's a lot of barriers to entry but like I'm trying to help I'm trying to amplify different you know people who are trying to help in the fertility space and I hope that I'm doing that in here and I'm so excited for the world to hear this I already have 22 episodes banked so like I've done a lot of work on it Wow. Um, strategically, I did that too, just to protect my privacy. Like there's going to be things that I, I've already redone episodes. Um, I pulled certain things off after having conversations and listening to them with my husband, because we want to have our own boundaries. We want to protect our, our world and protect our family. But yet we also like want to share with the world. Wow. Okay. So this is going to be a podcast series. It is. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other way that people would access this or mostly a podcast? Any, any place, any place where you get your podcast, you can listen to it, but also YouTube, we're going to be putting, it has a video component as well. So you can see the guests, um, you can interact with it, you know, however you interact with podcasts. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's going to be so much fun and I cannot wait. And then it's, uh, the daddy hood pot or it's at daddy hood podcast on Instagram, um, is where we're going to put additional bonus content too. Okay. Very cool. And so yeah. after this episode, this is live. Does that mean like one or two episodes are out? I actually think we're going to be launching with three, which That's is right. super, super exciting. And then right. yeah, every single week there's going to be new episodes coming out. Okay. So then we'll drop, if you're up for it, we'll drop the link to your to this podcast at the show notes of this episode so people can go see that directly perfect thank you i really appreciate that of course that's amazing i love i love it and colton i just can i just acknowledge and appreciate like the initiative you're taking to utilize your platform to raise awareness to educate people to bring help and support to areas you see lacking like not everyone chooses to do this you don't have to i really appreciate that you're going out of the, out of your way to leverage the power and influence you do have to help in areas where you know people don't have that like that's really noble i'm not trying to just like inflate your ego like that's like thank you it's really yeah i mean yeah we appreciate it for what it's worth thank you for doing that i'm very excited to hear your process in that oh thank you and thanks for sharing your story so open and vulnerable too we have a lot of work to do in a lot of different areas in our community and we need more people like you putting the work in and just understanding all of it we do
<laughs> oh God, we do. Is there anything else you want people to know about from what you're doing now that they should be aware of? I, you'll you'll know when I post about it. I'm just, I'm having okay, such a good time. I'm really just like enjoying my life. I'm saying yes to so many fun, different, crazy opportunities. I don't like to speak in definitives anymore to be like, I'm only going to do this because I could feel different tomorrow or a week from now. And that's what I think is so beautiful and freeing about being gay is the opportunity to say yes to so many things. I love it. That's awesome. Colton, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for thank you generously and just being you. You're amazing. We're so thankful for you. Well, I'm thankful to you. And this was a blast and we should do more in the future. Agreed for sure. Everyone, thank you for being here. Thanks for listening. Go check out Colton's podcast and all the things. We'll see you next time.